it's a pleasure to have all these classrooms and students uh, participating in our virtual farm tour today. The subject is water quality, nutrient management, a subject that's very prominent in Ohio these days. So we're glad you could attend. Uh, on behalf of the Ohio Soybean Council and Ohio Soybean Farmers and our education platform called Grow Next Gen, uh, we're very pleased to have you and we're excited that we get to be on an actual farm today and learn about water quality from Anthony Stapler and Logan Hockey. And with that, I am going to turn it over. Uh, I should say thank you to our director and producer, Dan, who's orchestrating the tour today. Thank you, Dan, very much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony Stapler, who can uh, introduce himself and his farm and, and talk about some of the things that are going on on his farm over the last several years. Anthony, take it away. Well, thanks, and welcome everyone out to our farm here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, I am the sixth generation farm uh, uh, on the farm here, and as well as my three kids, they will be the seventh generation uh, as we continue to grow the family uh, operation. Uh, we are a uh, bean, uh, corn, and wheat uh, farm uh, here, as well as a wean to finish uh, grow operation for horde livestock out of Busire, so we've got a little over 7,000 hogs that we uh, that we raise as well on our farm. Uh, certainly, uh, current operation, what's going on here today, it's random, of course, as everyone can see, but we are are, are looking to uh, be able to finish up beans next week. Um, we did just finish up the taking off the beans here this past week uh, on the field behind me. I think Dan has, a, has a, a video of that to be able to show everyone on that. We can do that. I can show the introductory video and then I can uh, share the video um, about the beans as well. Does that work? Okay, that'll work. Yep. That'll work. Great. Thank you. This is Lake Erie in October in 2011 and the water is totally green with algae. Looks like we're actually driving through paint. I mean, it's so thick. That is a lot of algae. The problem started coming back about 2000, 2002. It has accelerated, and the bloom that we saw in 2011 was two and a half times worse than any of the blooms that we saw back in the 1960s and the 70s. Dr. Jeff Reuter has been researching harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie for over 40 years. Lake Erie is the southernmost, the shallowest, the warmest of the Great Lakes. Uh, it receives the most nutrients, so biologically it's the most productive of the Great Lakes. But it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus found in sewage and fertilizer overfeed the algae, and the lake, made warmer from climate change, provides a comfortable environment for the algae to thrive. Well, when you put nutrients into water, it responds very much the same way as putting fertilizers onto our lawn. It makes the grass grow. When we put nutrients into the lake in the summer, when it's very warm, would be when you would expect to get blue-greens or cyanobacteria, and they are capable of producing toxins that can harm people, harm animals. We've had the harmful algal bloom issue on Lake Erie since the 1960s. When we solved the problem the first time, the primary source of nutrients was poor sewage treatment. So we solved the problem by greatly improving sewage treatment. Today, the primary source is agricultural runoff. Phosphorus and, and the nutrients in general are coming from fertilizers applied to the land or manure from a, an animal operation. Corn, soybeans, and wheat are all users of phosphate, so we have to have it. If we would stop applying phosphate at all to our soils, it would be a real drag on our farm's ability to grow crops. We can get phosphate from different forms, but the most uh, popular form is dry fertilizer that we apply to our field. 
Today, farmers like Terry McClure are using a fraction of the phosphate that the agricultural industry used in the 1970s, but in the past several years, a mysterious, more potent form of phosphorus has been running off farm fields. On his fifth generation farm, McClure has added a new piece of equipment to determine the cause. What you see behind us the two collection systems for, for collecting the water that's coming off of this field. This self-automated sampling gear at the edge of Terry McClure's wheat field periodically samples surface and subsurface runoff, which partners at Ohio State University will test to determine precisely how much nutrient runoff the field is producing before it makes its way into the lake. The idea is to figure out how the dissolved reactive phosphorus is leaving the land by measuring at the edge of the field. That's the research that's never been done. We want to know what farming practices will tend to keep the phosphorus on the land. Agriculture is trying to be proactive, but it's really a, an all hands on deck issue. This is, this is everyone's issue. Although agricultural runoff bears the brunt of criticism, cities with their concrete, green lawns, and larger populations create their own perfect storm of nutrient runoff. Uh, during a storm event, many of our sewage treatment plants have what we call a combined sewer overflow, where the volume of water entering the plant exceeds the plant's capacity. And in those situations, the sewage literally enters the lake untreated with lots of nutrients attached to it. No, that's fine. Here. All right, so we're standing in the middle of the bean field uh, that is part of the edge of field uh, quality for a uh, Lake Erie water basin. Um, this field here is ready to run. Um, we are in the final growth stage of it. Everything is beginning to dry down. So the beans, as you can see across the field, have dropped all of their leaves and everything. So we are uh, getting ready. Uh, the greenness is out of the stems, so we're gonna be close to being able to uh, harvest these. Uh, as soon as we get uh, a little bit of drier weather here, hopefully, um, and possibly by the time that we truly do the water quality uh, meeting here. So as we go across the field here, uh, we're going to be looking at approximately 50 to 60 bushel beans uh, going across here. Um, that's, that is the hope. That's pretty much what everything's been running here so far for us. Um, so as we go along and we uh, harvest these, uh, then we'll be getting uh, ready for uh, next year's crop that will be uh, wheat for this as well. So, and we'll be... Uh, uh, putting on nutrients from our farm, from the hogs, uh, to be able to, to grow the wheat on that, so. Can we get a look at a soybean and tell us kind of how you know when they're ready to harvest? Yep, so soybeans, uh, as soon as they uh, start to drop their leaves, um, you can kind of see the, the bean the leaves here that have, have deadened and everything. So as that plant uh, comes to a full growth and it starts to, to die down, um, it will drop its leaves uh, to where it will start to dry out the beans uh, that are in here and in these pods you'll have they're a little bit spongy here this morning because it's wet but you'll have your your beans here and uh, once those get down to a certain percentage that we like for uh, being able to take them to the elevator uh, which is about 13 percent moisture or below then we'll be able to take those off and be able to take them into the elevator and and go from there all right, so the biggest purpose of, of doing the, the meeting place today uh, and what they wanted us to talk about was kind of the water quality issue that we have up on Lake Erie. Uh, our farm was uh, selected uh, to be one of three demonstration farms for the state of Ohio. Uh, that is sponsored by a Farm Bureau, uh, the US NRCS and USDA ARS. Um, it's a multi-million dollar project for us um, and we're standing on uh, as the video show, we're standing on part of the farm here. You can be able to see the field uh, here behind me. And we've, so we've got this 30 acres that basically all flows uh, water surface and subsurface uh, into these testing stations here. So the one that I'm standing here right now is our surface uh, testing station. And as the water comes off uh, or we get a uh, a large rain, as that water comes off, it will come into here, and the testing uh, station will be able to pull up samples uh, 
uh, of the water as it comes. Uh, as water continues to flow through there, it will be taking a sample about every 15 minutes. Uh, as, as it pulls those, uh, it goes into the inside of the containment structure there, and it is filled with hundreds of little vials. And then they take those vials to the testing lab, and they're able to find all nutrients, whether it's phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, any of the phosphates, uh, any nutrient that comes off the field, we'll be able to uh, see exactly what's leaving here. And I'm going to walk over here to the other one. We'll open up the station for you guys to be able to see inside. So as we open this up, you can be able to see it's got a solar panel on top to be able to take care of all the electronics in here. And then in this uh, gray tub here is all of the vials uh, as it goes through and pulls all those samples up for us. So the big part of the, the farm is how do we regulate and go about being able to keep the nutrients on our farm. Uh, for agriculture itself, uh, especially in today's uh, commodity prices that we have, uh, every nutrient that we put out here, we want to try to save. Right now, we need to try to maximize everything that we can. Uh, so this, these stations here allow us to not only be able to see it on our farm, but be able to take the information that we're going to learn on our farm and be able to blast that out to the rest of agriculture uh, here for everyone to be able to learn off of on that. Um, and the, we're in year two of our of a five-year uh, plan on this. Uh, the first two years are nothing but a, a baseline for seeing how both uh, fields act on both sides of the road. Now, once we get through to the spring, we'll start to take both fields that are part of the research site and be able to uh, manage them different, uh, different cover crops, different practices of putting nutrients on, um, and being able to see and monitor what actually works the best. Uh, behind me, you can also see a what we call a water control structure. That uh, gray structure there um, is tied into the outlet that takes care of this 30 acres uh, behind me. And we are able to, when we're not into the field, we're able to uh, shut the water off to where we don't lose any nutrients. Uh, across uh, and allow it to go into the ditch. So that has been a big benefit for us to be able to take those nutrients and be able to keep them in our field as long as what we can. Uh, so this year, uh, starting in January 1, we went through, we closed, we closed everything as far as being able to let any water leave the field uh, that we can. And then a week before we go into plant or the week before we go into harvest uh, the grain, then we go through, we open up those structures to let that outlet work as normal. Now, when I say that we hold water back, we're not holding it back the whole entire time because Mother Nature takes, it, uh, takes the water and still allows it to go around the, the tile uh, and continue on below. But we're basically shutting off that water line that goes into the ditch. Um, behind me, I've got a a cutout of what the inside of that looks. So you can be able to see, so your outlet goes goes on the ends here, and then we basically have these slides, these plastic slides, and what those do is we can push those down, and that will shut off all the water that goes in there. Now, when we also say we're shutting off the water, we actually leave the water table, or the slide, about 18 inches below the surface of the, of the ground, just because we, as crops, continue to grow, we can't have our crops waterlogged the entire time. So we leave an 18-inch buffer uh, above that tile for us to be able to uh, get some excess water off but enable, but still allow us to be able to hold as much nutrients back as what we can on that. Anthony, a question for you. Uh, you yeah. mentioned the water control structures. Uh, what other management practices are you likely to use over the next three years as you continue this project? Sure. Uh, part of this project is also uh, cover crops that we're using out here, uh, different uh, oil seed radish, different rye grasses, um, and so on. Uh, we're also looking at uh, shallow placement, uh, deep. Uh, we also have our own, uh, we were, our farm was selected because of the hogs that we have. Um, so, of the three farms that we have that were selected as demonstration farms, ours is kind of the animal operation of it. Uh, and 
for what we're being able to see um, uh, kind of the animal sector of agriculture is getting a bad rap um, on a lot of uh, a lot of the news sources and stuff that we see and uh, we're kind of out here being able to prove out that that necessarily isn't the case um, on that. So between that and how we uh, apply our nutrients, um, those are, are three of the big uh, uh, things that we're doing on our farm. We're also doing a variable rate of our manure. Um, and Logan will get into the grid sampling part of that uh, here uh, on this part of that. But being able to grid sample and being able to variable rate our manure allows us to be able to put our nutrients in the right place at the right time and the right uh, application. Well, thank you for explaining that. I appreciate it. Yep. Uh, we have about 11 uh, schools and uh, about double that, the number of classrooms and uh, 400 students or more on the call. And we did receive some questions. Okay. From students. So, Anthony, uh, one question. Uh, does Do you get any funding from... Uh, anyone to do this project? You mentioned yeah. USDA and Ohio Farm Bureau. Could you explain that? That's sure. a question for one of our classrooms. Sure. So the funding for this project, um, the uh, testing stations uh, that are done, there are actually a total of 45 testing stations throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, uh, some of you uh, students may have heard of Great, Great Lakes and Aries have had the same algal bloom uh, issue that they had. So this was actually started, and agriculture has tried to be at the forefront of this for about the last 12 to 15 years as these stations have gone in. Um, so USDA ARS uh, gets grants and are able to help fund for, for this. Um, and then through NRCS, uh, equip funds uh, that are out there uh, are helping with the tile structures, uh, the control structures that you see there is about $1,400. Um, and with equipment funds through NRCS, any farm in the state of Ohio or across the United States can apply to see if they, if the fields that they have would be a good fit for this type of structure. Uh, they're kind of limited on rolling ground, any flat break. Uh, NRCS will actually cover about 85% of the cost of that. So that's some of the other money that's coming in and Farm Bureau is kicking in on being able to uh, get people out here and, and so on to, uh, and different types of ways that we can be able to test all the equipment that's out here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, what, another question. How much irrigation water is used by soybean farmers? And uh, if irrigation is used, where does the water come from? Sure. Uh, not many farms around here. Are, we don't have a, a big aquifer or water table uh, here where we're at here in Macomb. Um, but up in the northwestern part of the state, you've got the, uh, an aquifer up there that they're able to do some uh, irrigation, everything like that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, we rely on Mother Nature to supply all of our moisture here for all of our crops. Now I say that unfortunately sometimes because of the big rain events that we're getting, uh, part of the last two years of being able to see the baseline is a big problem that we're having on our nutrient load is being able to have these large rains. Uh, when we talk about major rain events, and I believe that there's a few slides that, uh, that Dan has sent out to all the classrooms uh, on that for the teachers to be able to show. Um, what we're seeing with these major rain events, and a major rain event is anything with two inches over a 24 hour period. Now, since 2000, since 2000 and two, it, we've, all, we've been keeping track of that, and we are uh, way and above the threshold of what we were prior to uh, the last 100 years uh, on our rainfall events. Uh, last year alone, we had seven major rain events here, which included a seven inch rain and about uh, 36 hours here. So we had water that was actually up over the ears of corn in the field that we're standing in right now. The water was actually running over the whole of our equipment here. Um, and you can see that in, in kind of some of the graphs there that Dan provided there in about the July time frame uh, on the surface runoff because we just 
couldn't hold that back. So Mother Nature is great, and we, we appreciate all the rain that she gives us. But sometimes we just get too much to where our ground, we just can't handle that much rain. Thanks, Logan, for that answer. We really appreciate it. I think it's time now to switch over to Logan. So if we can switch over to Logan, and Logan, you can introduce yourself. Logan, Legacy Farmers Cooperative, and uh, he can explain what he does. And uh, fire away, Logan. Yeah, so I'm Logan Hawk with Legacy Farmers Cooperative. Um, I oversee all the precision um, um, farming program that we have here at Legacy. Um, so as, as we talk here, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the precision side. Also do um, deal with all our government relations, water quality, um, that whole side of it, make sure our locations are taken care of as far as um, certification for 4R, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so just to give a little overview of what Legacy Farmers is, we've got five agronomy locations. Um, which are the suppliers to the crops. And we also have uh, 11 um, grain op, uh, facilities, which receives grain in. So we, we cover roughly um, six to eight counties um, we get into um, up here in Northwest Ohio, which we are in the heart of the Lake Erie watershed. Um, like Anthony was talking earlier, um, we had an early slide on what, uh, what that watershed looked like. We're right in the middle of it. Um, so I guess what the, just to start off here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the 4R, um, what that is. Anthony's already mentioned them, uh, doing the right rate, right source, right time, right place. So I'm going to try to step through that 4R and the water quality of the different, um, and how do, we, how do we get to each one of those 4s, uh, which each one of those R's of the 4R. Um, so I guess what we'll start with, and it's, it's the baseline to everything we're doing. It's where um, Anthony was talking about manure application, um, looking at the soil, looking at the soil and where that uh, fertility level is and how do we come up with that recommendation to be to apply. Um, so what we'll do here first is um, we, we actually have a soil sampling unit out here. Um, one of our soil samplers, Dan, um, he's actually going to run it here real quick and just kind of show the process of what we do. Um, so initially what we what we have is uh, we, we have a, a map and we roughly plug our points of where that uh, where we're going to pull our samples. Um, so, for example, this field out here, 30 acres, we would have like 12, 12 sample um, points, and then we have eight probes for each sample bag. So I'm going to fire up the motor here and uh, kind of give you an idea what the soil sampling unit looks like, um, how it goes through that process, and then uh, kind of where the sampling would go. Maybe. So what we do when we, we, we stop the rig and we, uh, we get in these grids, as you look on here, we have square grids around our points and we kind of take uh, eight probes across that area. So um, when we get to a point, we stop and uh, Dan will actually run this uh, sampler down um, and it'll pull a core. So we roughly try to go six to eight inches, depending on the soil type. If you want to pull ahead just a bit, Dan. So we take eight of these. And as that goes up and down, it distributes the soil inside of this uh, container. Oops, got a rock, I think. Um, so we go on this side of this container. So we got cores. Um, we get eight of those that fills that container about half full. And then those get dumped into a soil sample bag. So we have our soil sample bag barcoded. And what that is is that geo references, which uh, – marks that point, that area, do a reference, so that um, with that barcode, it tells us what uh, soil sampling package we have. When it goes to lab, it will actually be scanned, and then it will link back to our, uh, our um, software system after that is, uh, after all the results are back. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the, the old technique of what we had before we had the auto. Um, this is actually a little bit better of a probe than what we, we used to have. Most of them used to be hand probes. You had to bend way over about like this, the probe. This is actually a foot probe, so it's the same concept. There's actually marked for depth. And we just, oop, that's a, a hard spot. But we just push down. We get a core, and then we kind of, we beat it inside of a bucket, and that's how we, 
that's how we used to do it. But still, again, it would be eight cores. Um, but we get a we get a relative sample of our topsoil. Our topsoil in this area would be roughly six to eight inches. Um, in some areas, it's deeper. But that would be the soil sampling end of it um, to to get our soil to get our representation of what our nutrient value would be. Once once the soil samples are back, um, you guys would have uh, you guys might be able to see a map that we have. Um, of the soil test levels, but, um, but what it does is it links back to our system. So this gives us the opportunity um, as, as a, um, agronomist to go in and look at our samples. So what I'll do quick since that logged out, um, a relative idea of what it may look like is we would have a report and it would also give a soil test level result. So what that looks like is each point is a different level. So we look at uh, PC, which is our cation exchange capacity. Uh, we'd have organic matter, pH, and then our phosphorus. The P1 is one that we look at. Right now we're talking phosphorus with so the lake area side of it. Um, so how that, what we would do with those results is this is this is how we would come up with the right rate um, part of that 4R. So we would make a recommendation based off the tri-state um, and make a variable rate application across there. Um, in Anthony's case, they have manure. They would, he talked about variable rate, um, uh, applying the manure. That is taking different rates based off what that fertility level is we go across the field. So um, on, our, on our end as Legacy, we would be looking at um, MAP, and uh, MAP and Potash. So MAP is 11.520 and Potash would be 0060. Um, and that's how we would adjust our nutrient uh, levels. We also are able to look at um, some different yield data. This isn't from this particular field, but Anthony does this also as records yield data. We can actually take real-time yield data and use that um, as a uh, reference for instead of 180 bushel corn, 60 bushel beans, let's actually see where it's removing the nutrients. Um, so that's how we will come up with the right rate. Logan, Logan, if if I may interrupt, can you can you go through the other R's? So we just yeah. talked about right rate. Can you talk about the other three? Yeah. So the source would be um, of it. The right source would be our fertilizer that we apply as dry nutrient value, or um, here at Taylor Farms is the manure. Um, the right place is the variable rate application as we go across the field. So. Um, as we move across the field, we got areas where we may put a very minimal or zero rate of a, of a nutrient or um, heavier rate based off the soil test. Um, and then, uh, which one I missed here? Oh, and the right timing. So right now would not be the right time. We're raining right now. So um, what we look at right time is looking at forecasting of weather, um, make sure we're not doing it before a big rain event. Right now we have legislation. Um, both for uh, commercial fertilizer and for the manure side of it, um, that we can't uh, apply ahead of uh, major rain events. Um, so and it's only a agronomic and sound practice, so we don't lose our fertilizer. Um, so it kind of all ties in together. Uh, so that would be the four R's um, that we try to follow. Um, we are four R certified as Legacy with all five of our locations. We've actually been every location through all our three year auto process for every location. So we've actually moved into the, the fourth year on these. And what that looks like is we have to prove our records that we are doing all these activities um, and making the right recommendation to our grower for them to follow it. Well, and we so, have 10 or 15 minutes left. Uh, Logan, any other things you'd like to add? Yeah, so we were actually gonna fly the drone out here. Uh, but I'm going to just show a little bit of technology, other technology we do um, with our dispatch system, just how we get um, to our fields and how we can be um, uh, most uh, efficient as uh, soil sampling units or all of our spreader units. So if we look at the screen um, here, we, we have exactly where all of our work orders are at the current point in time. So that's one way we use technology along with our soil testing to dispatch and, um, and be able to uh, be efficient when we soil sample. So each flag is a work order that is ready to go. Each teardrop would be uh, a soil sampling order that has been uh, is ready to be assigned to a unit. 
So that is a way to be efficient across the countryside. Um, and then I'm going to flip over here too and talk a little bit about the drone and how that is uh, kind of changing our business. We're trying to learn from it. Um, a lot of farmers have drones that they, they fly over the field to uh, maybe find reasons to scout or um, holes where maybe they need to replant or weeds they need to be able to spray. So um, I'm going to flip over into uh, one, of our, uh, one of our images just to kind of show what this looks like. So this would be a drone image flown with MDVI, um, which we are taking plant vegetation. So we are looking at plant health and turn it into a map. Um, at, on this particular field, you can see how it's greener across the top. Less green here, we actually were doing a fungicide trial on that. And uh, we had an airplane come in and fly and we were taking it to yield. So we will actually, earlier that yield map, we would actually come in here and um, harvest this and see the comparison between the north side and the south side of that field. So why is that kind of important um, on the comparisons? This is another removal factor we, we try to figure into when, um, what, how far can we push our yield on our fields and um, the nutrients that we need to put to it. So at this, in this case, we're feeding it with foliar um, just to keep the plant healthy to, to uptake more nutrients and utilize what's out there in the soil and not let it go to waste. Um, which moves to corn or soybeans, which goes to town to the elevator as bushels. Um, so that helps, helps us kind of fully utilize what we have going on out in the field. Um, some of the scouting side of it, what it is, is we can actually upload this image on our phone um, and actually walk through the field and see our GPS location. So like this field out here, if the, it was a standing crop early in season, June, nice and green, we could actually walk out here and find areas of the field where um, why, why is this greener, why is this uh, a little more red on the image and prove if it's wheat, thin crop, or a really good crop. Um, and we can actually check that all the way to the end. So with technology now for water quality, um, our soil sampling side of it, it being efficient, stuff moving back and forth and no manual entry like we used to, um, we can get timely um, application um, versus what we had to do. Uh, years past, it would take roughly two to three weeks to get uh, information back. Um, now it's it's streamlined and it goes to the cloud and it comes back down to our computers um, within minutes uh, of being um, sank um, to our system. So that is some of the different technology we have. Um, I wish the weather was cooperating. We would fly the drone that would have that would have shown some of this imagery from um, from a bird's eye view. Um, I guess any questions that I could yeah. go over a little Logan, more. Very good. It's time for questions. Uh, any questions from our audience? If anybody has any questions, we ask you to please step forward towards your camera so we can see you and we will uh, get you called upon. It looks like we have somebody from Poland, Andy, stepping up here. We'll get them on the video here and have them ask a question to you. Go ahead. Uh, how much do seeds normally cost for all your fields to plant? Oh, uh, so it's roughly seed cost per acre. Uh, kind of varies. Um, we have $300 bags of corn. And a bag roughly does two, two acres, two and a quarter acres. Um, so you're looking at around a hundred bucks, a little, little over a hundred dollars an acre just for seed corn. Um, soybeans, we would be down more into the sixty to eighty dollar mark per acre for seed, um, just just to start the crop, crop and process. And a lot of that depends on the different traits, varieties, and everything else that goes into that. Um, you can get different fungicides and, and insecticides put on your, your seed as well before you even plant it to try to ward off anything on that. So it's kind of based on the technology that the companies use as well. Good question. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Please step forward towards your, uh, towards your cameras. We've got another one coming in from Olin Tangy. Uh, where, do, like, where do the beans go that you guys grow? The beans that you grow, where do they go? Um, all of ours go into legacy elevators, and then uh, they have their own uh, places that they've taken, whether it's the Andersons or uh, the different uh, other processing places that they're selling to on that. Yeah, 
so once uh, Statler's may haul in, um, we would take it to a, a processing, like he said, or actually we ship some soybeans down to the southeast. Um, is one place they go. Um, if it was corn, it could go down to um, Statler's. You know, they use their own crops for their own um, operation, but we we can ship some down to other um, poultry markets or um, poa ethanol, uh, which is in your fuel and uh, some other uh, hog markets in other areas. Step on up to the camera, folks. Anybody have a question? And if we can't see you stepping up to the camera, feel free to unmute your microphones, teachers, and yell at us. We got a lot of questions. One more Nolan Tate here. Uh, how many farms do you have? And do they also have the same technology this farm has? Very good. Uh, as far as the water quality uh, side of it, uh, there's uh, like I said, there's 35 or 47 uh, in the state of Ohio that are paired sites. Um, but as far as the other technology that you've seen here, as far as the uh, soil sampling and the drone, that's uh, a lot of that technology is coming into it. Um, I wouldn't say that 50% of the farms are there yet, but we know that approximately 70 to 80 percent of the farms are doing the grid sampling and but a lot of that is is jobbed out for um, people higher legacy or different co-ops like that to be able to go out and do the soil sampling uh, just because ease of convenience uh, when you've got an automatic machine they can fly across instead of me going out with a single probe and, and doing that the whole entire time while we're trying to get other things done on the farm yeah have, have you how many different farm locations do you, excuse me, do you have, Anthony? I think that was one uh, of the questions. Currently, we've got 15 fields, and we are uh, we're right around 650, 700 acres uh, of what we have. And then we also have our custom uh, side of it that people hire us to be able to uh, apply uh, on more uh, to their fields apply nutrients. So we're kind of doing the same thing as Legacy is, only we're uh, being hired to do it on the um, more organic manure side of it, and then uh, also on our green uh, operation as well, custom combine and, and doing things like that. So, yeah, I can give a little perspective from from our end, uh, dealing with uh, multiple growers. Uh, we roughly have uh, 200,000 um, acres under the precision sampling program over the course of uh, four year cycles. Um, so, and then uh, most of our fertilizer depending on um, the location, I would say 70% is variable rated. Um, so doing different races that goes across the field using the technology. So very similar to what um, Anthony is doing with his manure unit. Classers, any other questions? Uh, raise your hand, get close. Looks like we got somebody up at Putin Bay. How long did you apply fertilizer to your crops? Uh, for us, uh, we basically do it on a two or a three year rotation uh, just because of the weight of our uh, manure and being able to get some spread isn't necessarily a timely matter. So depending on the crop and the type of year that we've got, um, but when we apply our nutrients, we're looking at a two to a three year crop rotation. So uh, the fields here uh, are, just, we're just playing at the wheat. So next summer we will actually apply our hog manure to these sites and as we go through the testing side, we'll apply it a different way on each side. Uh, but then that application will take care of the next three year crop. So it will take care of next year's corn and then beans and then beans the following year. Excellent question. Questions? Other questions? Folks, come on up. Uh, wave to us, get in front of the camera. Uh, we might have somebody coming at us at Global Impact there, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. Go ahead. It was weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, China put tariffs on the U.S. Have you guys been feeling the side effects of that? Um, I think you can say that all of agriculture is kind of feeling effects on, on tariffs and how everything is going uh, right now. But it also, tariffs can kind of be looked at a different way that it opens up other markets for us uh, as well. Um, so, there's good and bad that comes with it. Unfortunately, uh, agriculture is the only surplus in the United States that is exported as much as what everything that we that we uh, produce. So uh, whether it goes to China or it goes to the uh, Middle East or Europe or whatever, um, 
other avenues are opened up for them on that. Yeah, We've actually just... seen on the input side a little more strain even on um, fertilizer, um, chemistry, and that um, as we look at the uh, global market, people are, uh, the EPA or other countries are looking to have more Clean Air Act. So they're shutting down factories that usually produce uh, products for agriculture that was imported. So that's also affecting it. So it's a combination of uh, things happening. Yeah, if I may, if I may add uh, a few facts, uh, up until recently, one of every three, three rows in the United States was being exported to China. So you can imagine the tariffs may have some effect on that. But as Anthony said, hopefully additional markets were open up. Unfortunately, the price of soy, once tariffs were put on the table, went down 15 to 20 percent. So. It'll be interesting to see how the whole tariff situation plays out. So wait and see it. Well, we're bumping up against 145. Is there one last question for many of our uh, classroom? Looks like we got a uh, Vinton County. Okay, so do you guys make a profit, or is it just strictly a research? <laughs> well, the the goal for us is to make a profit. Uh, Unfortunately, the last two or three years, uh, agriculture in a, in a whole has kind of been treading water on the on the grain side of it, uh, which is why we have to be as frugal as what we can with the nutrients that we're planting on our field, and that you know really goes into the water quality side on it. Uh, for our farm, we're a little bit more diversified because of the hog side of it. So, we not all of our eggs are in one basket. Uh, so that has helped us out, um, but we are looking for the greener pastures. <laughs> I think maybe what she might be getting at too is is the water quality portion of things. Is, is that for profit or is that you know strictly a, a volunteer research type of thing? Uh, the demonstration part was kind of a volunteer thing, uh, but also something that we want to know is as agriculture um, on the animal side of it. We look at it as, you know, a finger pointing on, on both sides of it to where we kind of open the farm and open the doors to, to people to be able to come out, see the hog farm, and see exactly how we're handling all of our manure. Uh, last year alone, we had a little over uh, 900 people out for our farm. We, when we opened the doors to the demonstration farm, we kind of said, we're going to put it out there and let's see see where the chips, uh, where the chips fall on that. So, but for us, uh, whether it's the cover crops or how we're applying manure, it also goes into our bottom dollar because we're able to learn off the research that's being able to be found here. Are we doing it right? And are there better ways for us to be more efficient as we go across and, uh, and get our crops to take it off? Great. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate that. No Director problem. Dan, are we finished with our, uh, uh, virtual tour for today do we have some last minute things we need to uh, take care of uh you know if there's any other last minute questions we can throw them on there um, you know we did have a video we didn't get to that kind of had the statelers talking about their farm and just sharing why they're doing what they're doing maybe we could close with that and then we can wrap it up sounds good great we'll throw that up in just thanks everybody thank you I find that I've always been interested in knowing, you know, just where we actually stood. We've always tried to do things, you know, yeah. the right way, but there's always opportunities to learn. And uh, it, it makes you stop and think a little bit when everything you read is you're a problem. And so I wanted to have the opportunity to say that, you know, come look, let's find out, are we a problem or are we doing things the, the right way that can, can benefit? The knowledge that we're gonna be able to get from our farm um, hopefully farmers like us you know or smaller you know hobby farmers are able to take what little bits that we learn and hopefully they look at it and say okay every little bit counts we may feel that we're just one small part of everything but every little small part continues to add up conservation is important to the future of our family operation because we rely on the ground they're not making any new ground. We can't go out and purchase any new ground to put on top of what we already have. 
we go buy someone else's ground, but we cannot remanufacture the ground that we farm. So it's invaluable to us that we protect and preserve what we already have. The Blanchard River Demonstration Farms Network is a five-year, $1 million partnership between the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service to study and showcase the impact of current and new on-farm conservation practices on water quality and nutrient management. For more information, visit BlanchardDemoFarms.org. We appreciate everyone uh, being with us today. We hope you uh, learned a lot. Uh, if you could uh, if you want more information about this or other education programs, please visit GrowNextGen.org. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey.